So my name is Bren Smith, and I'm a 3D ocean farmer located right outside of New York City. And my story is a story of ecological redemption. I was born in a little fishing village of 11 houses. I quit high school at the age of 14 and headed out to sea. I fished the Georges Banks, the Grand Banks, and the North Atlantic. Lobster tuna headed to the Bering Sea. Fish cod, crab, you name it, I fished it. The trouble was, is that I was fishing, I was working at the height of the industrialization of the oceans. We were ripping up entire ecosystems with our trawls. We were using ever more efficient technologies to chase fewer and fewer fish deeper and deeper into the ocean. And I've personally thrown tens of thousands of pounds of dead bycatch back into the sea. And it wasn't just that we were pillaging the oceans. Most of the fish I was catching was going to McDonald's for their fish wit sandwich. So here I was, a young fisherman, pillaging the oceans and one of the most unsustainable forms of food production on the planet, going to some of the most unhealthy, low-quality food on the planet. But at the same time, I loved my job. Like the humility of being in 60-foot seas, the solidarity that comes with being in the belly of a boat with 15 other people working 20 to 30 hour shifts for months at a time. I love that. And the sense of meaning and the dignity that comes with helping feed my country. These were some of the best days of my life and still I just miss them so, so much. But while I was on the Bering Sea, the cod stocks crashed back on the, on the East Coast. And thousands of fishermen were thrown out of work, boats beached, uh, fish plants shuttered, and it created this generational split. The, in, the, the captains of industry, they wanted to fish the last fish. They wanted to stay the course, but there was a younger generation of us that wanted to spend our life at sea. We were thinking 50 years. I want to die on my boat. And the, the short-sighted, brutal realities of industrial fishing would never let me do that. So I went, like a lot of, lot of younger people in my generation, went for a search for sustainability and ended up in, the, in um, the aquaculture farms up in northern Canada, fishing, I mean, farming salmon. And aquaculture was supposed to be the great answer to overfishing. It turned out to be just as destructive using new technologies, chalking fish full of medicines, antibiotics, polluting local waterways, just growing terrible tasting and quality food. And then when the public found out, the industry had adopted a strategy of mislabeling. Still to this day, whether wild, or farmed. You go to the United States and one out of three fish you eat are mislabeled. So just disillusion kept on searching and I ended up in Long Island Sound where they had this new program to attract young fishermen back into the fishery by leasing shell fishing grounds for the first time in 150 years. So I became an oysterman and I did that for a couple years growing my shellfish on the seafloor and then the storms hit. And once again, I found myself in this swirl of, trans, of, of uh, uh, environmental crisis and transition. Hurricane Irene came in, buried all my oysters. Hurricane Sandy, 80% crop loss. Most of my gear washed out to sea two years in a row. Ocean acidification, killing literally billions of shellfish seed up and down our coast. Rising water temperatures, spreading disease. Right, and this isn't just in Long Island Sound. This is happening globally, whether it's coral reefs, or shellfish, or um, even seaweeds around the, in, around the world. My farm, my job, my oysters, I'm, I'm, we're canaries in the coal mine for a climate crisis that's arrived 100 years earlier than expected. So farm destroyed, looking at failure. But when I look back now, that failure was the best thing that happened to me. I've become a, like, I love failure now. Because <laughs> It's the, mother, it's the mother of invention, right? It forced me to adapt, to figure out resiliency, to figure out new things I could do on the water, right? I had to re-envision my farm in order to rebuild my farm. I had to move off the seafloor, find these new species that were resilient to the, uh, rise, to the rising tides, rising water temperatures. I found the work of Dr. Charlie Yarish, who's out of the University of Connecticut. He's done, just done some of the best work on seaweeds. And I took his research and embedded it into my farm. So after 10 years of searching, I'm now one of the first 3D uh, ocean farmers growing a mix of shellfish and seaweeds for local food, organic fertilizer, and biofuel. So that's, the, that's sort of the journey from pillager of the seas to green fisherman. Uh, what I'll do now is paint a picture of what the farm looks like so you have a sense of what we're doing and then talk about the long-term vision for the farm. 
So that's the farm. Absolutely nothing to see but some buoys, right? <laughs> Makes a terrible PowerPoint. But that's a good thing. Our oceans are beautiful, pristine, wild places, right? So our farm is underwater. It has a low aesthetic impact, and that's the way we want to keep our seas. Here's a drawing of the farm. We go for simplicity, not complexity, right? So our, our farm system's anchored to the seafloor, hurricane-proof, to buoys on the surface, and then we just have floating lines on the top, right, where we, we grow our seaweeds and our shellfish vertically down into the water column. Below that, we have cages sitting on the floor where we grow other kinds of shellfish. There's a picture of the seaweed. That seaweed, that's kelp, and that, that, that's about three months old. Kelp's the second fastest growing plant in the world. Here are our mussel socks. We hang these on the same gear we hang our seaweeds. Again, a really simple multi-use system. We do scallops in the same way, hanging those. And then here are our cages. The cages sit on the seafloor directly under our vertical uh, uh, ropes. And, um, uh, uh, and we do oysters and clams in those. Uh, the whole idea is to have a small footprint. My farm has been shrinking. I went from 100 acres down to 20 acres as I've been using the full water column and growing actually a lot more food on those 20 acres than I used to on the 100. We've gotten away from monoculture. Uh, aquaculture is obsessed with growing one thing in one place. We're growing four kinds of shellfish, two kinds of seaweeds. Now we're even harvesting salt from our uh, 20 acres. Here in Bermuda, there, there are shellfish, there are seaweeds, there are sponges you can grow, seaweeds like grassalaria. The whole idea is to do an ecosystem analysis of what's possible to grow, what are its multiple commercial values, and what are things we can grow that are actually restorative, that help the environment. So the farm, we have three main things we do, like longer goals. We want to have good local community-based food production. We want to reimagine the fishermen of the future as a restorative farmer, and we want to build the foundations for a new blue-green economy. So on the food front, I love food. I'm not a foodie. I eat at the gas station most nights. <laughs> but what food has taught me, it's a wonderful way to build community, right? So um, uh, what we've done is we, have it's, we start with a really, really healthy stuff. So our mussels, our scallops are packed full of omega-3s. Our seaweeds have more iron than uh, red meat, more calcium than milk. Um, and we do something called a community-supported fisheries program, where people buy a share of the farm at the beginning of the year, and then every month they're getting um, good local seafood, and we trade recipes, and the whole idea is to have this farm and create a community um, uh, around the food we produce. The other thing we've done is we've taken these exotic things. America has no tradition of, seaweed, of eating seaweed even though it's local. It's right outside our back door. It's something we can grow. So we've challenged the chefs, and we say, listen, we've got an exotic thing that's local. Can you reimagine the American uh, menu around things that are truly sustainable and local? And they've, they've stepped up. So those are seaweed cocktails we do. We do kelp ice cream, kelp butters. Those are fettuccine noodles that are total pasta replacements uh, and gluten-free. The whole idea is to carve out a section of the dinner plate to not eat fish, but to eat what fish eat. Because fish don't make omega-3s and all these wonderful things, they eat them. So if we begin eating like fish, we get all the benefits, but reduce pressure on fish stocks. At the same time, it's scalable. In, in a 300 by 300 foot area, I can grow 24 tons of uh, sea, seaweed in five months. That doesn't count the hundreds of thousands of shellfish that I also grow. If you were to take a network of 3D farms like mine, totaling the size of Washington State in the US, you could technically feed the world. Now, not everyone's going to eat, become an ocean vegetarian, of course, but it shows the potential for this to be a piece of the puzzle as we face food crisis because of drought, fires, all these things in the era of climate change, while we have rising uh, populations. So the other thing is, the, the other piece is restorative farming. So as an ocean farmer, my job is not to be this ocean hero. It's not to save the seas. My job is to have the seas save us. And I say that because Mother Nature created hundreds of millions of years ago two technologies that actually mitigate our harm, shellfish and seaweeds. Oysters are these stunning agents of sustainability. They filter 30 to 50 gallons of water a day, pulling nitrogen out of our oceans. 
Overnitrification is the cause of these spreading dead zones that are uh, um, absent of any life and oxygen. Our farm functions as an artificial reef system. As our coral reefs disappear, there, there's, no, there's no foundation for, the, for ecosystems to be built around. We attract over 150 species back to our farm. Which, what was once this barren patch of ocean is now this thriving life. Oh, our, and the other thing is our farm functions as an artificial reef system. I mean, as a storm surge protector. So it stands in the way between Hurricane Irene and Hurricane Sandy as they pummel the, the shoreline. It reduces the amount of destruction. This is our kelp. Kelp makes me a climate farmer. And the reason is it soaks up five times the amount of carbon as land-based plants. It's called the sequoia of the sea. In my own little way, my farm, farm is running as carb, a carbon sequestration uh, a plant. The, same, the other thing is our, our kelp is used for biofuel. If you were to take a network of kelp farms totaling half the size of the state of Maine, you could replace all the oil in the United States. In a one acre area, I can grow 2,000 gallons of biofuel um, a year. And remember, this is with zero inputs. This is true for food and biofuel. It requires no fresh water, no fertilizer, no arid land, making it the most sustainable form of food in, literally in the world and a su sustainable source of biofuel. Final, finally is fertilizer. So all farms pollute, land-based farms, even the most organic, wonderful farms. They, what, they leach nitrogen into our waterways. So what we do is we capture the nitrogen with our sea vegetables. We take them and put them on farms. This is a program we have with the Yale Sustainable Food Project. They use it to grow their beautiful vegetables. Then the nitrogen leaches back into the sound. We capture it again. We're creating this closed nitrogen farming loop. And the whole idea is to build a bridge between land-based and sea-based farms, because too, much our, too often our analysis of the food system stops at the water's edge, and we're trying to get beyond that. The final thing is creating a blue-green economy. I'm, I'm an environmentalist, but I'm not an environmentalist. I'm not going to do all this remediation and create these farms unless, unless p fishermen are making a living. The goal that in the era of climate change, both on land and sea, is we need to figure out how to make a living on a living planet. Our economy is going to change. To Hurricane Sandy, 83,000 people were thrown out of work. This is a serious challenge we all face. So one of the things we've done is we made our farm open source. So anybody with 20 acres and a boat, about $50,000 in the US, can start their own farm and be up and running the first year. The farm is specifically designed to be replicable. We've got a program called Project Green Wave, where we hire inner city kids to package, cook, process all of our food. They learn about 3D farming. They learn about uh, sustainability. One of the kids at the school, it's called um, the Bridgeport Sound School, actually took the kelp and invented a 12-volt uh, kelp-powered uh, biodegradable battery. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, I'm just a fisherman. These kids, it's just uh, amazing, right? So the, um, you know, uh, oh, and I th on the blue-green economy, I think we can think much bigger than this. Why can't we take my farm and embed it in offshore wind farms? Why do we just harvest wind? Let's harvest food, fuel, fertilizer. Let's bring it back to land and reclaim the coal plants that are shutting down near me. Reimagine the fossil fuel industry. Turn them into kelp biofuel and fertilizer plants. Let's put greenhouses on the top in order to create a local salt industry. This is our opportunity. Why can't we make a million new um, ocean farmers in the next 10 years. You know, we have to act. We've triggered one of the largest marine extinctions in the planet's history. And every other breath you breathe it comes from marine life. Like, we've screwed things up. And, but in a way, that's what's exciting. Because our backs are against the wall. We have to innovate. We have to uh, figure out strategies for resiliency. We have to completely change our relationship to the planet and, and reformat our, our economy around principles of sustainability. So when I talk to politicians about this, they just think it's crazy. And they, and they say, the, you know, the idea of creating a million new ocean farmers, there's, just, there's no way. And they're right. It is a little bit crazy. But you know, to get from here to there, to make it through this transition and do what we need to do to make it through a, a climate change and make sure everybody can make a living on a living planet, maybe exactly what we need right now is a little bit of crazy.
Thank you. That's it.